Good evening, I'm Peter Sárosi, and you are watching Drug Reporter Cafe, a talk show on international drug policy reform. Today, we will discuss the chances of drug policy reform in a Scandinavian country, Iceland, where the government announced in January that it plans to decriminalize the possession of drugs for personal use. I have two guests from Iceland today here who will help us to understand the situation in Iceland. The first is Svala Johannes Dottir, harm reduction specialist and the head of the first needle and syringe program in Iceland, and currently the head of a homeless shelter, shelter in Reykjavik. And the other is Haldur Morgensen, a member of the Icelandic parliament, the Alting, representing the Pirate Party, which is in the forefront of reform initiatives. Hello, and thank you so much for, for accepting our invitation. Thank Hello. you for inviting thank us. You. Uh, so before we start discussing the drug situation in Iceland, can you both tell me a bit about your backgrounds? So how, how did you get engaged in, in the drug field and uh, what are your personal experiences, motivations here? Mm -hmm. Let's start maybe with uh, Swala. Yes. So I started work with uh, homeless people in Reykjavik around 2009 or 2007. And uh, yeah, so I have since then mostly been working with people who are homeless in the city and people who have a um, injection drug problem. Uh, I got to know harm reduction uh, uh, when I was staying in as an exchange student in Holland in Utrecht. Um, because as we know, uh, harm reduction was very late uh, applied to Iceland. And we actually started the first harm reduction service in 2009. So we in, in Iceland, we are actually far behind in other European countries. Um, yes, so I have mostly been working in the shelters, uh, on the field, uh, and now more as a harm reduction therapist uh, and a teacher. And uh, yes, and through all this year, I've got to know uh, hundreds of people in my city, Reykjavik, who inject drugs and learn mostly, I would say, from there, from them about the, the situation, because we have so little data about actually how their life is and actually uh, about the drug market in Iceland, which is quite different than in the rest of the mainland, because Iceland is an island, and uh, most of the use here um, that people are injecting are uh, prescription drugs. So methylphenidate, ritalin, uh, morphine, like contagin or oxy, that's our, sort of the main drugs that people with severe drug problem are injecting. Uh, and then after that, we have cocaine and amphetamine. Thank you. Haldora? Well, for me, uh, it's a strange journey. I guess it comes more from um, having myself... Um, experienced it. So um, living through kind of the party scene as a, as a young person and uh, seeing a lot of my friends never getting out of it. You know, at some point it stops being a party and it starts being something completely different. Uh, and kind of just being witness to the suffering that is involved in, in getting stuck there and not being able to come out. And harm reduction is something that I wasn't um, introduced to until much later. But for me, it was always more on an intuitive level where it just didn't make any sense uh, the way that people were being treated. And um, this whole idea of I researched a lot into, into drugs during a time and this, this idea that really drugs have always been available to mankind from the very beginning. And this crazy idea that we would somehow be able to stop drug use um, with these methods of these, these authoritarian methods that are being used uh, and is just causing so much human suffering all over the world uh, rather than preventing it. And for me, I was always thinking, how do we prevent this suffering? So when I uh, was introduced to, to harm reduction and these ideas of decriminalization, uh, it just intuitively made sense. And then I started looking at the research and the science behind it. And all of a sudden I realized that it was insane 
that we had not already done this uh, because the system that is in place now does not have any research to back it up that it actually functions or works and uh, really I don't understand how we are getting away with continuing with a system that it doesn't have anything backing it up that it actually works. So Swara, you started to talk about the, the drug market in, in Iceland mm -hmm. um, and you said it's it's really different from mainland Europe. Uh, can you can you tell tell us more about the, the drug scene in Iceland? Also, is, mm -hmm. is there, are, are there like other drugs used like cannabis uh, in Iceland? Can we uh, and and how do I mention party drugs? So so what what mm -hmm. drugs are used? What are the main trends? In yes, this? yes. So I mean, like in most other countries, uh, people mostly use alcohol and cannabis. These are the uh, biggest uh, type of drugs that people consume. After that, we see amphetamine uh, and then cocaine. And then, you know, when people have more kind of uh, problematic drug use, they sort of go more into the prescription market. One of the reasons for that is because, uh, because we're an island and it's more uh, harder and more difficult to get drugs to the country, we have seen that... Uh, Many of the drugs that are important are actually less, uh, there's a less quality and they are much more expensive. So the drug, drug market in Iceland is quite expensive. The price has been stable for the last uh, 10, 15 years, which no one really understands why. But we see that the gram of cannabis is the same today as it was seven years ago. We see that the price of amphetamine is the same price today as it was uh, seven or 10 years ago. Uh, the drugs that are, um, we have noticed that the drugs that are produced in Iceland, we have, uh, most of the cannabis is pr produced here. Uh, most of the amphetamine is probably produced here. We have a lot of uh, upbringing in spice consumption, um, which is quite sad because uh, it brings a lot of health problems and we're seeing it a big proportion of uh, Prisoners are using spice. Um, and I mean, we completely understand why, because they are uh, punished if they use something else. They're trying to, you know, um, get away with the punishment um, inside the prisons. And so we see, like in other countries, that when um, we see type of drugs being used inside the prison, it, it slowly with the years comes outside to society. So, yeah, most of the people that I have been working with over the last 14 years um, inject drugs or smoke opiates or, or a cocaine. But when we look at the more of the party scene, it's more kind of uh, MDMA, uh, amphetamine, cocaine, and then we have some kind of uh, psychedelic drug scene. Just quite similar as in the mainland, but we don't have maybe the same amount of varieties. And it's really expensive. For example, in, in Iceland, there's no heroin. There's no heroin use. The heroin that comes to the country is usually imported by uh, individuals who have, have uh, experience using heroin abroad. And, but it doesn't really go to the illegal market uh, to sell. And when it has happened, we have seen that uh, the quality is quite bad. And it's really expensive. So people who like opiates, people who uh, develop an addiction to opiates, they use prescription medicine, like fent fentanyl plasters that they, they cook up, or contelkin or oxycontin. If I, if, yeah. if I answered well enough, yeah. Well enough, thank you. Uh, in, in, I remember back in uh, 2015, I read an article in the UK tabloid, the Daily Mail, and mm -hmm. it said that uh, Icelanders smoke more cannabis than any countries in Europe. They have, I don't know if you if you read that article, and if 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 you if, if you can tell us if if that mm -hmm. was true, because I suppose it was not. Mm -hmm. Well, I think from the uh, statistics from Europe, we are definitely not uh, the biggest smoker of cannabis. But what we have, what we have seen, of course, and in other countries uh, lately, that the, uh, the cannabis is getting uh, much stronger. And sort of that's kind of the main uh, problem with the illegal market is that people don't have a choice. 
uh, people can have a choice about uh, what strength they want and what type they want. And that's exactly what we have seen the last five years in Iceland, that the cannabis market is getting, yes, the THC is getting way, way stronger. Um, I'm not so sure like where we would rank from the latest uh, numbers, but uh, I know that we are definitely not the top three, if it answers. Uh, yeah. Hadora, when you when you went to school, how, how difficult was it to, to buy cannabis or any other illegal drugs? When I was younger, <laughs> uh, it was never very difficult. It was. Not. It's always it's always been easy, and I think it uh, f- for for the kids often it was easier than getting alcohol, you know. Mm. But um, but it also I think it depends a lot on obviously what what kind of cliques you're in at the same time. But I think it's getting even use easier. Maybe Svala can. I believe that they're using Facebook now and and social media to 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 sell and buy and it's if anything with technology it's just getting easier mm-hmm. I'm, I'm also asking you because you know there is this so-called icelandic prevention model which is now like advertised all around the world as, as something like a miracle you know that in in iceland in schools uh, there is a specific, you know, drug prevention campaign, and uh, because of night curfews and because of some uh, limitations of, um, uh, of of young people, and also like uh, uh, alternative recreational activities organized, and and uh, there was a dramatic decrease in the use of drugs among school children. And uh, I was wondering how accurate is this picture, or how 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 much do you think that's that's accurate? Mm-hmm. So when we look at the uh, so-called Icelandic prevention model, it is uh, it is true that it, it has it did enormous impact, and one of the reasons for that is because there were so many institutions in society that was working together. We have the school, we have uh, um, motivating families. Uh, so the, the, there was a lot of things that that worked together, and and that's what we see that. Uh, Prevention, if it's supposed to work, needs to have. It cannot be isolated to, to just the school or just a short uh, solution. It has to be a long term and many working together. Uh, what interested me as a harm reduction worker is that um, we are worried that uh, the the younger people who do develop an, an addiction who starts to have problem with drugs around 14, 15, 16, they are actually probably in a worse situation today than they were 10 years ago. And we have a feeling, I cannot say that we're sure about it, uh, that that's one of the reasons is because of marginalization and because of harsh uh, drug policy in Iceland when it comes to people under 18 and a prejudice against young people using illegal drugs or developing an addiction. So the sort of um, mentality in Icelandic society is sort of zero tolerance. And it's been very strong for a long time. And obstinate-based models have been used uh, for a long time and nearly for everything when it comes to uh, drug use. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Iceland, Iceland country started so late uh, developing harm reduction service. And uh, so this kind of mentality of looking at drug use or drug problem in a different way is very new for Icelanders. And uh, I mean, so many things have happened in the last um, 10 years, but we are wondering if the, the people, the young people who actually develop some kind of problem or actually in a worse situation. And that just has to be looked better into. Yes, if this answers enough for you, Peter. <laughs> Can I just jump in quickly Please. regarding that? Because it's really interesting because I actually grew up in, in the UK. Uh, I, I didn't really come back to Iceland until I was uh, 15 or so. And uh, I really felt this attitude that Svala is, is, mm. uh, is talking about, like personally, living in England, it was kind of normal that kids were playing around and trying to smoke joints. And uh, it it wasn't really 
and a lot of people, it's it's kind of, even though it's illegal in the UK, obviously, the attitude around it is that it's kind of normal. It's kind of okay to, to smoke weed every now and then, you know. So even with the grown-ups and that was the feeling that that I had growing up there, that this wasn't a, a huge taboo. It was just a little bit like drinking alcohol. Whereas coming to Iceland, I really felt that uh, the idea of smoking a joint was synonymous to almost just shooting up heroin. You know, that was that, that's kind of how how society looked at it. But it was the same also with with drinking alcohol, you know, going to a bar. Uh, and this is just a short while ago, going to a bar on Tuesday and maybe ordering uh, an alcoholic drink for lunch. You know, it'd be looked at like you're an alcoholic or something. It's crazy. <laughs> so this this attitude has been slowly um, changing. But but I think it has the effect that uh, that we're not truly informing kids in the correct manner, like the information that they're getting, they know is wrong because they can just go on the internet and read about it themselves and they understand that they're being lied to. So I think one of the most important things when it comes to preventative methods is the information that we're giving kids, that it's uh, correct information and that we're treating them um, like they, you know, like they're sentient uh, thinking human beings and, and, and not idiots. Uh, I think that this is a huge step that we need to take. And this, if I can add one thing, because I we have been I've been really we have been really thinking about this for the last years because we have our child protection law is quite u- unique compared to most countries. Uh, it means that uh, uh, if you as a citizen or especially a professional, uh, you have an obligation to call the child protection if you have any concern or any knowing that the person under 18 is uh, using substances. And that means that, for example, people from 16 to 18 who may be um, are using illegal drugs or uh, would probably need the harm reduction service don't actually go there because they know that the law says that they have to call the child protection. And what happens in the child protection in Iceland when they get that phone call is that usually uh, a police officer is sent out to look for them, to find them, uh, which is, uh, and actually uh, a person that is not in a unit and not in a marked car, uh, and they are taken to two weeks uh, to a lockup in, a, which is called Stuhler, uh, because the approach is, this abstinent only approach, we need to stop the drug use. And so there's a lot of complication there. A, the people, the youngest groups that we want to use the harm reduction service, they do not come. They either just maybe go to a pharmacy to buy in injection materials, or they send someone who is already 18. Um, so there's a little connection there because this is the approach. They are afraid that if they uh, go to a service and healthcare or a harm reduction service, this is the process that will happen. They will end up in a, in a child protection home and they are locked inside there for two weeks. But how is it, can I jump in, Svala? How is it with the, rehab, with the rehab? Because this I find really interesting is that most kids, it's just a natural part of growing up is that you show a sort of um, risk behavior is just one of, you know, one of these things that is, all kids go through. And so it's quite common that during this risk behavior time in, in your development, that you're trying uh, new things and you're trying, kids are trying drugs. Mm-hmm. And in my understanding, a lot of kids are ending up in rehab also with uh, grown-ups. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of stories of kids who are going to rehab with grown-ups because their system or their parents are forcing them to um and they're coming really out of it with a lot more risk behavior, you know, because they're really getting to know proper people who've really been using drugs for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And this I, I find a little bit crazy, but also, also um, this is one of the reasons why I think decriminalization is so necessary is that instead of taking these kids and, and giving them the message that they're doing something wrong when really what they're doing is quite natural. 
um, we should be creating a safe space for them to do, to, do, to do it in because most of these kids are, they're just going to try, try and then they're going to stop. They're, most of them are not going to um, create or have a, a bad habit of, of, of drug abuse. You know, this is a very, very small group of people who end up there. And then the underlying problem is something very, very different to, to the drugs that they're using. The video you are watching now is produced by the Rights Reporter Foundation, a non-profit organization which is not supported by any governments or political parties. If you like this show, please support our work on our website, drugreporter.net. Make a donation today and become our supporting member. It makes a difference. Thank you. Yeah, so as I understand, the uh, picture is not so bright as, as it is reported in the international media. So. Uh, but still, uh, do you think that it had some kind of success, this, this Icelandic prevention model in like reducing the number of teens who use drugs or what? why is it so much hyped? Because it, I mean, for the majority of the uh, young people, it has had success. We can see that in the numbers and uh, there are people under 16 in Iceland uh, drink less alcohol, they smoke less weed, and they are less likely to try uh, other types of drugs than, uh, than all of the other countries in Europe. That's what we see. So for the, uh, what we would say, majority of the people under 18, this, or mostly 16, this prevention model is working really well. What I am mostly concerned about as a harm reduction worker is that the uh, younger people that uh, it doesn't work for. And we are worried that their situation, the small group of people, that uh, they were just forgotten. They don't fit inside this, this prevention model. And we, as a country, should have uh, put a focus on this small amount of young people who already. Uh, are in some kind of uh, problem with drugs because of their living situation, some kind of pain or other stuff. And um, we would have wanted that the government would specially kind of think about how are we going to uh, meet these people because I was a project manager for a mobile uh, harm reduction car here in Reykjavik for five years, from 2015 to 2020. And uh, we would go around uh, all of the city area and uh, provide uh, needle exchange, harm reduction education, uh, and health service with nurses. Um, and sometimes we would meet people who just became 18. And when you start to hear um, their stories, uh, and about how many times they were locked up for these two weeks or maybe three months because they were forced to go into uh, uh, drug treatment. Um, and I'm not saying that, you, uh, that we should never force this policy. What I'm criticizing is that when you're meeting children or young people who have experienced this maybe 20 times, 25 times, 30 times in their life, you meet them and they trust nobody. They are even afraid to come to the harm reduction car. Uh, they're afraid to what to say to you because the system broke their trust. This is where I put the big kind of question mark. And I think this is inhumane treatment to young people who are developing a drug problem. Uh, and what sort of how we are approaching uh, young people with drug problems in Iceland is similar to Sweden. This kind of really, um, uh, yeah, you know what I mean, Peter. I don't know the English word for it. Tough, tough love. <laughs> sort of <laughs> tough love and uh, zero tolerance of uh, young people using drugs. Um, and I just want to make it clear. I'm not saying we should never do it. I'm just saying when we have when we are doing it for the fifth time or the tenth time or twentieth time, I would want people to sit down and say, "Okay, this is clearly not working. What can we do to uh, make this person uh, life quality better?"
better and help her to live through this, if it makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And we we have been filming in Sweden about drug policies, so I know what you speak about. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's it's pretty interesting for me, you know, to see that all the Scandinavian countries who had this very strongly rooted abstinence culture for several mm-hmm. years, now they are kind of opening up to harm reduction and decriminalization. But we can also see in Norway or Sweden that there is, and in Sweden there have been no needle exchange for a long time, and now there are some at least. Mm-hmm. Norway wants to decriminalize. So, uh, do you think that now Iceland is also opening up to to harm reduction, and um, are there new uh, opportunities in this regard? Yes, we have managed. I have to say, quite enormous thing in a short time, and. For example, this program that I used to run, which is um, called Fru Ragnar and is run by the Red Cross of Iceland, uh, was sort of the first formal harm reduction service in Iceland. And it was really important, not only for uh, the clients, for a drug consumption or the drug users uh, society, but also just for Iceland as a country, because the program brought kind of... uh, the message of harm reduction, that uh, we need to approach people in a humane way with compassion and empathy and love to, to stop this fight and just work together and have a conversation. And, you know, all of this thing that abstinence only approach doesn't really have grounded in itself. Um, and uh, the people who are working there now um, uh, in the program, they are just, they're doing a fantastic work of going to the media, of uh, uh, reminding us that we cannot uh, break the rights, the human rights of people who use drugs. And uh, then we have another organization called Snarrotin, which is sort of a drug policy reformist organization and a harm reduction organization. They have also been very active going to the media, writing articles, being active on social media. And so... And then we have Haltora and, you know, other people from the Pirate Party who and everyone have sort of been speaking up and uh, demanding different kind of approach. And in a very short time, I mean, I'm so glad that uh, this had happened because, I mean, when I started in 2007, I just couldn't believe how we were treating people. I mean, I was working in the shelter for homeless women. I was meeting these women who were in in uh, so much pain, you know, and uh, yeah, just so glad that 2021, you know, we are there. There is a bill in the parliament about decriminalization. Uh, The government has uh, approved now that uh, we can uh, put up and uh, we can put up a uh, safe drug consumption in Reykjavik. I mean, it's just so many things that happen in 10 to 15 years. And uh, I am very positive. I know it's also like a lot of struggle and, and, and we have a lot of uh, conservative people here who don't want any change. But the group who's speaking for a humane drug policy, which is built on science and uh, compassion and uh, to focus more on harm reduction, I think that group is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Adora. Hadar, as, as a politician, you, you it's your job actually to be concerned about public opinion. Uh, what do you experience? Like, is it is it difficult for you as uh, as a member of parliament to raise these issues? Do you get many negative um, comments or uh, reception from the public? I don't know. I'm quite dog headed. So when it comes to caring about the public opinion, of course it matters to a certain degree. But at the same time. I'm very passionate about the things that I'm passionate about, (laughs) if that makes any sense. So, uh, I mean, I started talking about medical marijuana here, and Jesus, that was uh, not a popular topic and uh, still isn't. I I don't think I've ever been in in, in Parliament in session uh, speaking uh, about any proposal before which has gotten so little <laughs> so little um input from from my fellow parliamentarians like there was literally no other party that would touch it and i still fought for it um 
I think two or three times until I gave up and decided to change it over to CBD. And I thought maybe that would be uh, an easier step for people to take to to be willing to legalize uh, CBD, which isn't a drug. You know, it's it should just be classified as a food or a vitamin. But um, but regarding the the decriminalization, I think a huge part of this is also. I mean, there's been a conversation for a long time. When the Pirate Party came to Parliament first, this is back in 2013 to 2016, uh, the first Pirate Parliamentary Group in, in Althinki, they put forth and they got a proposal accepted to put together some sort of working group or committee to look at um, what we could do to reform our drug policies. And from that work, there was a lot of... Uh, points that came out. And one of them was this, this um, drug consumption rooms that have now been passed. And I think a, a, re a reason why, a, like a huge reason why that was able to do that is also we have a health minister who is willing to push these things also and is excited about them too. And that helps a lot to, to have the current health minister pushing for these things. So I remember when we were, when we had this uh, drug consumption room bill in the hands of the welfare committee for the first time. Uh, I was chairing the welfare committee at, at that time. And when the policy came to us, it just wasn't ready because it had so much opposition from the police and a large part of it working uh, in a society that hasn't decriminalized possession of drugs, a large like uh, intrinsic part of that working, that policy is that the police are willing to play along, you know, because they really have to uh, look the other way a little bit for this to work and stop harassing these drug users who are coming into these spaces with their drugs on them illegally, of course. So creating the safe zone for, for this, we needed the police to be on board with it and they just weren't in the beginning. So we had to send it back. And one of the biggest steps I think is when we sent this policy, uh, this bill back to the Minister of Health, we did so with a message from the Welfare Committee of Althinki that uh, we were directing the Minister of Health to look at, to take this a step further and to decriminalize drugs, drug possession. And this was a huge, huge step. And from that, um, I decided to put forth this proposal or this bill of decriminalization because I saw that the Minister of Health wasn't going to do it. Um, and this is now, now we've kind of pressed her to a position of where it's coming out now. And I really have, have big hopes for it, but it's difficult because there's a lot of politics going on also behind the scenes. And it's difficult to really figure out uh, whether, like who honestly is going to, to, to lobby for this to go through. So if I understand you well, this this safe consumption room is is already it is it is it exists. So it, it is something happening now. And uh, no, is that unfortunately uh, not? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately not. And we everyone is waiting for it. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that the bill went through, uh, so uh, you're allowed to run uh, a safe injection site or drug consumption room in Iceland, but the next step has to be because the interesting part which no one really understand is that uh, in the law uh, a municipality has to uh, apply uh, to a, a director of health in Iceland uh, to open up a drug consumption rooms and drug consumption room in Iceland are um, uh, or sort of uh, named uh, a specialized health service. So no one really understands why it's put on a social service to actually apply for a health care service. And so there is some kind of uh, thing we see going on there. Uh, but uh, the municipality of Reykjavik and the health ministry have given out that uh, they are going to start a conversation um, about. Uh, applying an open one but everyone is still waiting and um, the drug users on the street are waiting they're constantly asking they're like Sala, when is this drug consumption going to open because i mean uh, in the city i mean 
we don't have uh, necessarily so many people sleeping on site because we have now four shelters for both homeless women and then homeless men. Uh, but it is estimated that in Reykjavik area, we have around 350 homeless people uh, who are living in a uh, uh, not safe environment and, and have to use the shelter sometimes. And so the population that is often has to use drug outside uh, is waiting for it. And uh, it's hard for me to say uh, what sort of stopping it, but I think it's also this regulation that the social service has to apply for something and the health care is not taking responsibility of doing it themselves, sort of on and a political level. It's also just the politics getting in the way of progressing. You know, it's it's always yeah. the the local politics and the you know the the parliament kind of, or not the parliament, the 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 government just clashing a little bit on 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 who's responsible for what and who's going to do what, and it's a little bit of a mess and it's a sad mess because it's something that should just be done asap. Mm-hmm. Another thing that uh, we are having also a little bit problem with is the analysis. It's a, actually a um, source of a really uh, s- a sad situation is because um, the naloxone nasal spray or just naloxone in general is uh, a prescription medicine in Iceland. And that sort of means that the barriers for the, uh, uh, for the person most in need of it uh, is way too high. And there is there is no drug use in, in, in Iceland who has naloxone. We have no distribution of naloxone. Uh, there is no kind of uh, first aid or, or opiate prevention, uh, how do you say, programs. To, um, and um, it came on the market in Iceland two years ago, and we, we tried very hard the harm reduction uh, society in Iceland to push for it that it will be that everyone could go to the pharmacy and just buy it and get the training there or that the harm reduction established harm reduction service could distribute it but it was very hard and so we are also what has been happening now is that actually the services the shelters the outreach program uh, the mobile needle exchange have also had difficulties of getting naloxone just for the staff. Um, but that went through, I think, one or two months ago uh, that they made some kind of a change in the regulation for it. But uh, um, we really need to start distributing naloxone to people. Yeah, because we had we have actually quite high overdose rate in Iceland compared to the rest of Europe. And one of the reasons is, uh, I mean, the ground reason is because of stigma. People are, are, are afraid to call because if you call the ambulance in Iceland, in 95% uh, around, yeah, when it comes to drug use, the police will come with them. And so people are afraid to call the emergency line uh, because the police is going to come and they don't really know how the police is going to treat them if they're going to take the drugs away or they're going to arrest them. and. And so there is, yeah, there are these kind of small things that we are always trying to talk about and trying to get a, a change. Yeah. So it, it sounds to me that one of the main barriers in Iceland is repressive drug laws. Uh, so can you tell us uh, what is what, what does the law currently say about drug use? So what are the sanctions, and how would you uh, how would you change that? Uh, and what what is the current uh, a proposition in the parliament on, on how to change the drug law. Mm-hmm. So is that to me? Um, so now, uh, I mean, we just have a, a flat out ban on, on, on uh, all consumption and, well, not consumption, but possession and uh, buying, uh, selling, distribution, you know, of, of, of uh, drugs. And of illegal drugs, and uh, what what we what we what's happening now is we have a bill from the the Minister of Health, 
which is decriminalizing the the possession mainly of uh, of of drugs for personal consumption. The problem is that 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 everyone brings up the critics bring up is you know how are we going to define what is for a possession and not you know which is uh, we shouldn't really have to find the wheel you know again because Portugal have done this and and other countries have done this so we can look to other countries but the main conversation here and what i find is stopping this is always when we start talking about decriminalizing decriminalizing drugs for personal use someone talks about it as you're legalizing basically you're making it okay you're making it legal for people to have drugs uh, possessing drugs for personal use and what about the message that we're giving to the children this is like the huge thing so then we're basically the message that we're giving to the children is that it's okay to use drugs and uh, this really scares people and then they talk about how well we've been doing in um, in uh, getting young people to stop using drugs as much so that this they almost talk about decriminalization the critics of this bill as if it's just going to all of a sudden open up the market more and and make all drugs much more available to young people and we're just going to have a flood of young people uh using using drugs if we're doing this so this is the main scare tactic that the critics are using and it's a real like it's a real fear and i think it's based in this misunderstanding that we have about what um what addiction is and this is one of the things that i intuitively have felt for a long time but when i heard johan hari say it in a in a ted talk that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety uh, but connection to me that was really a game changer and of course it is and this i think is something that the people who really oppose uh, drug reform and decriminalization, they don't understand this. It's like they still have this belief that drugs have some sort of chemical hook that if you if you try a line of cocaine once, you're just gonna you're gonna be a cocaine addict for the rest of your life. Like this this uh, belief structure is still so um, tangible. Uh, in in Icelandic culture, and I think in a lot of countries all over the world. So that is, I think, the root cause and the basis of this misunderstanding that we're having in the conversation. And it's difficult to fix it. You know, it's difficult to fix it, but we're doing a lot, lot better. There was a a poll recently in Iceland which showed that 60% of Icelanders are now um, positive about the idea of decriminalizing, decriminalizing. And that that's huge. That's a huge change that's happened in a really, really short time. So it means that we're, we're doing well with the, the conversation that we're having in Iceland regarding this issue. And it means that, um, that you know, it's, it's, it's inevitable that change will come. It's just a question of when. Now there's some very strange politics going on around the Minister of Health's um, bill. And I think a huge part of it is is kind of our fault, the pirates' fault. I say this in you know <laughs> because we forced a vote on our bill um, during the last session. We did this because at the end of every parliamentary session, there's a a period of time before we close for summer where we have negotiations uh, between the parties on, and we wanted. Uh, to force a vote on our bill on decriminalization because they were trying to kill it, basically. They were trying to kill it, send it back, uh, send it to the minister to work better or whatever. They were just trying to kill it because they don't want a vote because a vote is painful to them because they don't, they're against it, um, but they know it's going to cost them. So that's, it's kind of turned around in Iceland. It's public opinion is with decriminalization, but it seems that there's too many people in Althinki still who are against it and they don't want to make their vote transparent to the public because they know that there will be backlash. And that's exactly what we did. We kind of, uh, we forced a vote. And because of that, a lot of people voted against and the bill was uh, felt, it fell, it wasn't, uh, didn't go through. And there was a huge backlash and the parties felt this. They felt that really the people are wanting this. And so the Minister of Health was really forced to put out this bill now that she has. And unfortunately, 
she hasn't garnered the support of the police, the the Surgeon General, um, and the medical, uh, you know, the people in in the in the medical industry or the the healthcare sector. She hasn't uh, gotten the support of these groups, which is incredibly important, and that means that her bill is now in a precarious place when it comes to being able to, whether we're able to, to finish it or not. So before we conclude our uh, discussion, uh, I'm asking you both uh, just to, you know, to wrap up, like uh, how, what would you see uh, the most in like in five years, where should Ireland, where should Ireland be in five, la- five years in terms of drug policy? What are the main changes you expect uh, the government to make or any, any, any you know, new services to be opened? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, Svala should definitely answer this one first. <laughs> in five years, I um, I think we have uh, most likely uh, have opened up our first uh, drug consumption room uh, in uh, Reykjavik. There is, um, I mean, the uh, health uh, ministry is uh, has uh, put aside 50 millions to open it in the collaboration of Reykjavik City. So I think that will be open. And I think just the whole harm reduction service field will have most likely grow because we're seeing uh, enormous uh, a positive uh, aspect of it uh, both with the uh, uh, our clients and also uh, like harm reduction services in Iceland they are actually quite popular when it comes to um, the people in the country they are actually they get a lot of support people like Haldra will was going ex- explaining is that we have 60% of people now saying yes to decriminalization. I mean, that's huge. I mean, the same research was, that was done, I think, three or five years ago, where it was, I think, we didn't even reach 40. So, I mean, there's an enormous amount of change. I am also hoping because harm reduction in Iceland has just been focused on people who have problems with drugs. We have not managed to get harm reduction uh, approach into a broader section of just drug use in general. We have um, festivals and the uh, bar nightlifes in Iceland uh, have sheer, zero harm reduction approach. Uh, we have, it's really normal here with big festivals that they are, they work with the police, they have uh, uh, drug dogs inside the festivals. And which can be really dangerous for young people who are seeking the, the festival because they consume so much before they go in. I mean, so, I mean, we are trying to open up that we just, when it comes to this, we need to put uh, safety and health of our clients in broad perspective as a front. And harm reduction is the, the, the most effective ways when it comes to that. Yeah, so I think... You know, that's at, at least how I see it. And of course, I mean, I have a uh, hope that we will change uh, the situation with Naloxon because, I mean, if I have to admit, I mean, it's a disaster. We have Naloxon here finally, and then no one can get it. The people who are in the most danger uh, and, and, the, and they are asking for it. They're asking, why can I not have Naloxon? I mean, they just, so I think, I know, hopefully. In one year, we will start to distribute naloxon to people in a most need. And, you know, I am positive that the decriminalization bill, maybe not this one, but maybe the next one, we need to get it through because um, it's a very, um, how do you say it? It's a very um, dangerous drug loss that we have here. And it brings... Uh, a dangerous kind of mentality around it. And uh, it sort of is a threshold of building up our harm reduction in Iceland. We need decriminalization to be capable of doing it. Yes. (laughs) Yes, Thank you. Haldora? I absolutely agree with Svala. And uh, maybe just add that 
this, this always this conversation it just makes me think of um, the rat park experiment, uh, which probably most of, of 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 your viewers know. But this idea that uh, where you have the rats in the bear cage uh, who become addicted to cocaine, and then you have the rat park where they have lots of activities and they have all of their rat friends, friends and buddies, and uh, and none of them really seek out the the cocaine water. You know, they're they're just happy in their rat park, and it makes me think of the society that we've created, and uh, also these stories of how how animals seek drugs. Um, m- most animals on the planet seek out drugs when they're in a state of um, sorrow or anxiety or you know fear, but uh, mainly when they're sad, when they're um, they seek out drugs. And to me, I think drugs have a purpose. They have a purpose in 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 our in our culture, in our lives, in society. And it makes me think whether the societies that we've built ourselves are just these. Uh, um creating this constant state of pain and sorrow and whether that is the reason why we're seeing so many people uh, abusing drugs uh, because we lack this sense of identity we lack this sense of security we lack this sense of connection and that makes me think really what we should be focusing on is the root cause like why have we built these societies this way and how can we change it and how can we, why are we not putting all of our resources and knowledge in uh, uprooting poverty all over the world? The way that we see that we've been dealing with COVID, where all of these countries all over the world are coming together, all of the scientists are putting everything aside to try to find a solution to COVID. What if we did this for poverty? Um, I think we would be looking at a very, very different world. And I don't think we would be looking at the same drug abuse problems that we have today. And I don't think drugs would even have to be illegal, really. So that is, I think it's just important that we also look at this holistically and um, and really start looking at the, the root causes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And, and for my behalf, I can tell you that it's really inspiring to see what you are doing in, in Iceland. And not because, not because Iceland has so wonderful drug policy, because we saw that it has not. But but it's really inspiring to see that change is possible despite of this repressive uh, drug policy, and you are uh, you are really like made a big progress in in, in the recent years, uh, and it's 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 also inspiring from my part of Europe where we don't see that change uh, coming in the near future. So so Hado Raswala, thank you so much for for accepting our invitation and being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Peter, I am so, I am so, how do you say it? I'm so thankful for Drug Reporter because it's just uh, such important and great work that you're doing. And uh, I'm always advertising it to everyone in, in Iceland and a lot of people are following you. And so thank you for bringing us uh, to let the, the world see a different kind of expected uh, situation of people with uh, different types of policies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svala. And I hope that next time we will discuss uh, Iceland in Drug Reporter Cafe, we will, uh, you will you will speak from a country with uh, decriminalized drug use. And, and thank you also for <laughs> those who are watching us uh, on Facebook. Uh, please uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we will let you know the next, uh, what, what will be the next episode of Drug Reporter Cafe. And don't forget that Drug Reporter Cafe is operated by a non-profit organization. So please uh, make a donation uh, for the Rights Reporter Foundation. Thank you and goodbye.